Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. President, Afghanistan is experiencing a politically dynamic period. Ten days ago, we witnessed an extraordinary series of events in Afghanistan, which demonstrated both the possibilities for peace and the enduring structural obstacles. On 7th of June, President, President Ghani declared a unilateral ceasefire for the period of 12th to 19th of June to commemorate the Eid festivities, which concluded the month of Ramadan. Two days later, the Taliban announced their own unilateral ceasefire covering 15th to 17th of June. During these overlapping three days, both sides honored their respective ceasefires for the first time in the past 17 years of conflict. Many Afghans reacted with jubilation. Local government authorities invited the Taliban to lay down their arms and enter cities to visit their families. Some Afghan soldiers visited Taliban-controlled areas. Social media was inundated with photos of Taliban fighters embracing Afghan security forces. President Ghani then proposed to extend its ceasefire, a proposal endorsed by UNAMA and many members of the international community. The Taliban, unfortunately, recommitted re themselves to battle. I regret deeply that the Taliban did not take up the opportunity to cease fighting and reduce violence. Their decision to fight will only increase the sufferings of civilians. It is nonetheless worth taking stock of how much has changed this year alone on the question of peace in Afghanistan. The national unity government's offer for peace talks without preconditions made during the Kabul Process Conference on 28th of February created a new reality. Even though the Taliban did not formally respond to the offer, a number of other developments re reinforced it. First, we saw an unprecedented grassroots movement. Beginning in March, ordinary Afghan people began setting up tents in around 20 provinces out of 20, 34, where they protested for peace. In early June, a group of 2,000 religious scholars met in Kabul. They pronounced suicide bombings to be against the teaching of Islam and called for ceasefire and for peace talks to begin. At the beginning of Ramadan, one of the first groups to set up peace tent began a 500-kilometer march from Helmand to Kabul, stopping along the way, gaining support for the call for ceasefire and talks and reaching Kabul last week. The demand to end the conflict is addressed to every party to the conflict. The Afghan people's genuine demand for peace, coming from the bottom of their hearts, must not be ignored. We should ask ourselves two, two questions. What have we learned from these uh, events for peace? And how do we respond? What we have learned is that both the Afghan government and the Taliban have command and control over their troops. Afghans, including Taliban fighters, clearly want peace. It is also clear that President Ghani is taking courageous steps to seek peace through talks. How do we respond? In returning to the battlefield, the Taliban insist that the goal is to end the presence of foreign forces in Afghanistan. Therefore, they shun direct talks with the Afghan government. However, any future political settlement in Afghanistan must take into account the concerns of all Afghans. The Afghans must talk among themselves to end the conflict and to decide on the future. This clearly requires the Taliban to have direct talks with the Afghan government. We believe that the issue of international forces will inevitably be taken up in the comprehensive context of peace talks, which will determine the future political order for all Afghans. I should like to note here that regional efforts to counter terrorism have been receiving more attention 
with some important international conferences organized by Tajikistan and the UN Office for Counterterrorism. Mr. President, preparations are now underway in earnest for parliamentary elections in October and presidential elections planned for the spring next year. Since mid-April, over 7 million people have registered to vote. This is the first time since 2003 that Afghanistan is conducting a complete re registration of voters for both parliamentary and presidential elections. The goal is a single national voter register which, which can produce accurate polling station-based lists. When achieved, this is expected to reduce fraud significantly. The registration of over 7 million voters is a positive achievement under the difficult circumstances, particularly in security. On closer scrutiny, however, there remain reasons for concerns. First, in six provinces, less than 35% of estimated eligible voters were registered. Secondly, registration within provinces is uneven, with certain areas prevented from registering for logistical or security reasons. Given Afghanistan's multi-ethnic composition, the exclusion of these communities could lead to significant contestation of election results. The disparities have also affected candidate nomination. This time, elections in Afghanistan are conducted as a fully Afghan-led and Afghan-owned process. All Afghans share responsibilities for transparent and inclusive elections. The Independent Election Commission, the IEC, has the primary responsibility. Each commissioner must become fully aware of the lofty responsibilities they shoulder for the future of Afghanistan. To strengthen the foundation of democracy's democratic political process and also to demonstrate that Afghanistan is determined and ready to take on the challenges to bring about an independent, sovereign state which can stand on its own feet. Political parties and political leaders need to be fully aware that they also carry a large part of responsibility for credible elections. Rather than simply criticizing the process, they must be actively engaged to make elections truly Afghan-owned. We welcome the commitment by civil society to conduct observation at every polling station to monitor voting, counting, tabulating, and transmissions of results. The international community must support them in their observation. The United Nations has 23 international experts currently working with the IEC and Complaints Commission, as well as their respective secretariats and additional technical advisors are being recruited. We, the, Un the Un UNAMA, will do everything possible in cooperation with the international community to assist the Afghan efforts to bring about transparent, inclusive, and credible Afghan-owned elections. Mr. President, the Geneva Ministerial Conference on Afghanistan, hosted by the United Nations, and co-chaired with the government of Afghanistan is to take place on the 28th of November. The conference comes at the midpoint of the transformation decade during which the country transitions from dependence on the international community to self-reliance. The conference will focus on three areas. First, the extent to which the country is moving towards self-reliance and the effectiveness of aid. Second, remaining challenges, for example, insecurity and job creation. Clearly, both more safe country and one in which the private sector can grow faster is key to create employment. Third, the link between short-term humanitarian action and development cooperation. 
The link between peace and security, humanitarian action and development is a key theme for the United Nations. And the Geneva Ministerial Office opportunity to focus on this nexus. In Geneva, we expect the Afghan side to report on the achievement in the areas of development, poverty reduction, and reforms, and outline concrete plans to address remaining challenges. In response, I count on Afghanistan's development partners to support strongly the people and the institutions of Afghanistan as they move the country forward. We are encouraged to see that the Afghan government is already looking beyond the transformation decade. For example, by working to increase regional connectivity and trade. Much has been achieved, but much remains to be done in the domains of peace, security, and development. Geneva affords us all this year's best chance set in stone the road to, safe, to a safer and better future. Mr. President, much of Afghanistan, in particular the North and the West, have been struck by drought, more severe than anything experienced in almost a decade. Wheat production in 2017 was reported to be 57% below the five-year average. The 2018 harvest is forecast to be even lower. The humanitarian response plan has been revised by $117 million, up to a still modest total of $547 million, in order to enable the United Nations to provide relief to affected populations and complement work by the government to service people in need. Mr. President, while our attention has been focused on large political processes, it is important that we not lose sight of the critical issue of the protection of women's rights. UNAMA recently issued a report on the use of mediation to resolve criminal cases of violence against women. I was greatly disturbed by the findings. The report found that a majority of these cases were resolved through mediation instead of being prosecuted according to criminal laws. In many cases, these traditional means of resolution compounded the original violence. Women were left to suffer. Women who have been subjected to criminal violence must be able to assert their rights according to the law. Mr. President, the key political events of peace and elections are far from assured. But we are seeing unprecedented opportunities to make progress, to seek peace, and to consolidate the political foundation for the future. Afghanistan's evolving development needs uh, and, and needs the strategies to address them and being reevaluated as part of the preparation for the Geneva Conference. In other words, the coming months will present critical opportunities for the international community to seriously review and adjust the way it is supporting and assisting Afghanistan in, it, in its effort to bring about peace, democracy, and self-reliance. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. President.